If you really want to help people, you really want to help people, go f get educated. Go get a qualification. If that's what you want to do. And g'day guys, welcome to episode 34 of Ask Woodford. I'm your host, Christian Woodford, as always. Um, impromptu Ask Woodford, just thought we'll get another one done. Had a lot of questions. Um, we just bank and bank and bank. If you got a question for us, ask away. Go to write to us at info or PM, PM myself, PM Alex. But what we do is we just bank them up when we can answer, answer them. We answer them the best of our ability. We can't, we don't answer them at all, as usual. Um, just quick shout out to um, uh, all you guys who helped us with the Joe DeFranco um, social media push to get me on the show. Um, just to give you a little bit of an update, it has worked. So Joe got in contact me. Yes, that is correct, Joe DeFranco. We, um, my idol, the guy who started it all, the guy who I um, kind of had when I had no one to look up to and no, no, uh, no kind of how, how to put it, no one. Light at the end of the tunnel, he gave me that light. When you're at Uni in Australia, there was really no light. There was either academics or pro sport or nothing. No one ever talked about the private sector. And I looked towards him, he gave me hope. He gave, I wanted to become the Joe DeFranco of Australia. Um, but do it my own way, not copy off him, not be my own person, which I have. Um, but um, I told him my story through his um, wife, Ashley, and they what Ashley put up on her, uh, her Facebook my whole story, and then Joe messaged me, and then from them we started talking. Um, this has been going on for two to three years now. Um, we're kind of I went to CP, CPPS in uh, Texas, um, and I once again I said who I was. He, he remembered me, um, and then just back and forth with um, with him, and um, just followed his work for years since I was a kid. Since I was uh, 20 years old, I'm now 32, just to let you guys know. So 12 years I've followed this guy. He gave me hope. He gave me, he helped me create Woodford. He helped me live my dream. Um, and through my dream, a lot of you guys have lived your dream. So I always pay it forward. Um, when he got a show, the Industrial Strength Show, um, it kind of first started when I was at his CPPS. It has grown to do massive numbers. Um, he has massive reach. And I said to myself, I want to go on his show. And when I, when I put my heart and my, my soul to it and I want it so, so bad, I put it out to the universe. That's the law of attraction. When you want something, there's no reason why you can't ask for it. What's the worst thing that he could have said? No, fuck it. I'm going to put my, I'm going to do anything to make my dreams reality because I believe in myself. I believe the product that I give to you guys and the, the value I give to people. I didn't want to be just your average. I want to become the best. And um, I say this with all my heart. When I do something, I don't do it in half measures. That's what makes me successful because I'm willing to go to the nth degree to make it happen. And I believe that's what everyone should do. Do something with passion. Don't do it with, um, don't do it with, just don't do something for the sake of doing something. Do it with love, do it with passion, and people see that, and that's why people come here. I'm a nut job, but I do it my own way as well. People will get, oh, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. I don't really give a flying fuck what anyone thinks. I'm just gonna do what's in my heart, because actually I'm a good person. Yeah, and don't worry about all the swing, all that crap, that's secondary, because that's my passion. And I just be myself. There's, no one ever tells me what to do, I'll just do what I feel like, really. Even my own parents will try and tell me something. Very rarely do I listen to them, but I always, never ever try and do it to hurt someone else. I just do it off my own bat, because I actually care about this industry and I want it to move forward. Um, and Joe DeFranco was that guy. So we did this whole campaign, as you saw, tagged out Joe DeFranco. So I want to thank all you guys for tagging him. It got through to him, of course, because Joe's a great guy. Um, and we're gonna, um, I'm going to fly over between anywhere, probably early December, I'm going to be on the show. Um, pretty surreal. It hasn't really hit me yet. Oh, I'm excited. It's hit me. I'm fucking Has it? I, it hasn't hit me. I don't reckon it's hit me. To think about this guy that I've followed for 12 years, right? This guy was the light at the end of the tunnel. I started reading Joe DeFranco when I was 20 years old. First year exercise science, right? First year exercise, I started, oh, probably even earlier than that, 19, I was probably reading. And before I was a PT, I was doing probably personal training, doing my Cert 3 and 4. Back when I was free back then, when I did it when I was free. Um, but just to, um, it hasn't hit me, the fact that I'm going to go over for the third or fourth time to America to learn, because I'm going to take that as a massive learning experience once again. It's just an experience in my life. I'm investing again in it. Um, fantastic. The fact when he asked me, it kind of got me um, real shivers and goosebumps, and it's like... Here's a guy who I've followed my, my, my idol, my guy who gave me the passion to do this, gave, you know, made me believe in myself enough to do this. A guy from the other side of the, of the world, sorry Alex, other side of the world to allow me to do this. Um, fantastic, the fact that I'm gonna be on his show is just ridiculous. And you gotta realize I haven't been doing this six years. This company's six years old. In, in, in uh, September was six years old, six. What am I gonna do after 10 years? Oh boy, damn. My whole idea of starting this was to be the change, evoke the change, change in the game. And he was the guy I looked up towards. So Joe DeFranco, an absolute fucking star. You're my idol, mate. Um, I stuttered when I talked to you the first time, but you better believe it, I'm coming in hot. 
and I'm going to give your viewers something that they've uh, I probably and uh, my mate said to me can, it'll be funny having you on the show because I have to listen to Joe's podcast sped up because he talks so slow. <laughs> so it's going to be classic to hear uh, the interaction between Joe DeFranco, Christian Woodford. Yeah, I'm talking myself in the third person, but it is what it is. But to hear our interaction. Um, it's a fantastic, I, I believe I've got such a fantastic story to tell his, uh, his readership, his viewership. Um, I think they're going to love me. I hope they love me, but I'm sure they will want to hear that, my story. Um, I'm an Australian, first Australian coach I've had on the show. It's is surreal to say again. The fact that, I, yeah, it's just a very surreal feeling right now. So um, private sector, that's what I wanted. I've um, six years into this journey that I started creating Woodford. I've had its ups, had its downs, but just to let you guys know, this didn't start for you six years ago. This started when I was 18 years old, when I, or 16 years old, when I did my first work experience in the gym. It all started back then. I've known what I wanted to, be, want to do since I was 13 years old. 13 years old, I wanted to do this. I've, I've committed my life to doing this, my whole life, and I love it. So if you guys get anything from that is, don't, two things out of that, that rant. One, follow your dream. Don't let anyone ever belittle your dreams and believe you're not good enough, because you all are good enough, because I'm not the smartest, but I'll tell you what, I commit 110% to anything I do and I've got passion and love for what I do. The second thing I wanna, wanna, uh, want, want you guys to get from that is when you do something, do it with passion, do it with love. Don't do it because society says do it, your parents do it, your friends do it. Fuck all that shit. Go for your dreams and go for them with passion and heart. Tell the whole fucking old world. Law of attraction, because I did. And look what happened with Joe DeFranco. I'm gonna go on his show. Fucking incredible insane. So thanks guys. Thanks for all your support. Alex, first question. Susie from Instagram, what would be your recommendation for a place to start in terms of study? Love to get into coaching. I'm a registered nurse and midwife. Looking for a change. Place to study. Um, anywhere. It's all the same shit. Is it? Yeah, all the same shit. I'll be honest with you. People always ask me, which is the best you need to go to? I couldn't give a fine fuck. Would you honestly think I ever ask one of my guys, oh, did you, did you go to Deacon? Do you have I don't give a fuck. I don't care. It's not, people don't understand. It's all the same stuff wrapped up a little market a little bit differently. It's the same shit. For me, the most important thing is this. A, do you have passion? Do you have passion? B, once again, notice how you see success leaves clues. And I told you, the reason why I looked at Joe DeFranco because one, he had passion. Two, he just got results. And for me, when I was at uni, it was kind of more about, did you publish a paper? Was what's your title, your name? For me, I didn't give a flying fuck about that. It was like, this guy's getting results with real athletes. I want to know what he's doing right. So for me, I always go look at the top performers. What are they doing? And in every industry of every top performer I looked at, I just kept seeing the same things. I kept seeing the th same things. Communication, relationship building, passion and love for what they do. I kept seeing that. So in answer to that question, for me, it wouldn't matter. But yeah, you need, you know, it's all wrapped up, marked differently, but yeah, for me, having a foundational knowledge in exercise is important, but it's the ability to communicate, build relationships and apply that knowledge is so important. So, don't worry about it. Get a degree in any area. Get your study up. Um, but once again, you can study a three, four year degree and still know fuck all. It's about kind of what you get from it. That's the most important thing. How do you apply it? Applied knowledge is king, in my opinion. So what was her name? Susie. Yeah, Susie. So anywhere, Susie. It doesn't really matter. Anywhere. Um, as long as you, as you apply yourself and really get something out. Make sure you, it's like, those, it's like, like I'll give you this reference. It's like doing work experience, Alex, at a professional sporting club. And you tell all your mates, oh, I've got a fucking internship at it. A professional sporting club, right? I say to them all the time, what did you learn there? Did you get a hands-on experience? Did you program it all? If you, if you didn't, that's okay. Did you coach at least? If you did coach, what did you coach? What were you coaching? Hinging, squatting. Okay, how, how, did, how did that challenge you as, a, as an applied coach? Did you get much out of it? A lot of these guys doing internships at pro sport to say they work in pro sport don't get any application from it. Useless, fucking stupid. You can do a uni, you can do a three, four year uni, doesn't mean shit, doesn't mean you're gonna be a good coach. Does that what I'm saying? You've got, to be, you've, got to, you've got to be passionate, you've got to really involve yourself. Dan, and this was in response to a tweet you made about how clubs are paying one to two K per game, yet they don't want to invest in hiring s &C. So, Dan asked, would you think if a club took on a board, players who cost a bit less, and put that saved cash to hiring good s &C, that the team would outperform those who didn't despite player skill differences? Say it, say it again, I couldn't understand, say it again. Yeah, probably, because, listen, Probably, the reason why I'm saying that is because, um, but once again, how, if you're looking at taking the best players, right, and then you're saying you're, you're gonna take players that they're not as high level, but they prepare better, would I do that? Yeah, I probably would, because that's gonna create a higher culture of performance, that's gonna create a better culture around the club, than say taking on a better paid player who's paid more, um, but, uh, 
doesn't put in the work outside of it. So yeah, I probably would. Yes, I think they would. Yeah. Jared Once again, just quickly, that's a wide open question. That's too. Well, you said it was a great question. No, but it is a question, but it's very wide open, mate. There's many factors to that. Many factors to performance. Jared Burton, currently studying at the University of Sunshine Coast doing clinical. Oh, potty! Clinical exercise physiology degree. I'm doing a case study on an amateur volleyball athlete who is wishing to increase their vertical jump by mm. approximately 10 to 13 centimeters mm. in one year. Mm. What insight do you have on the best application on? power and speed while maintaining specificity of the sport. Well, volleyball is, um... Depending, uh, look, I don't know much about the sport of volleyball, but this is what I do know about volleyball, right? God, my phone's going nuts. No! Can you just turn on All right, fine, 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 fine. I'm here for this, lock it. I, oh, I'm not locked in. I can do two things at once. Can you do two things at once? I can do six things at once. Damn! Um, listen. All I know about volleyball is if you look at volleyballs, what are they doing all the time, Al? What are they doing all the time? Jumping. Yeah, no, but yeah, elastic. Hey, there's sometimes they could just do one jump, spike the ball, could be one jump, or it could be repeated jumps, right? So they're, they're doing a counter move. Their skill is a counter movement jump the whole time, right? Now, so they're going to do that all the time. What do we want to counteract? If they're constantly doing that, the chance of injury is high. What is the main thing that we can control and that we can maximize that will enhance that jumping ability? We know. I'm asking you, Alex. What is the main thing we can do that can enhance power and speed? They're doing that all the time, right? Huh? Yeah, strength, strength, very good. We know strength maximizes jumping and sprinting, short-term sprinting performance. We know that, right? So my question, my answer to Jared would be, number one, Jared, the volleyball plays jumping consistently all the time. So the first thing I'll be doing is, jumping is a skill, right? So I'll ref make sure the skill is broken down and broken down to parts and maximize each part. It is a skill. So number one, there's a skill component to it. We know that, right? Jumping, landing, acceleration, deceleration, change direction, it is a skill. To max, to, for the nervous system to express it in the most efficient way possible, i.e. activate a motor just during that specific motor pattern, you need to break it down Progress it, regress it, based on physical literacy. Okay, so you need to do that, right? That's the first thing I'll do. I'll look at how they jump, how they land. Here's another thing, Jared, which is most important. Landing. Landing-based mechanics is critical, right? Eccentric strength. What is eccentric strength? The ability to absorb the force, control the landing. Now, people, people neglect breaks. Breaking is critical. The best athletes can break, isometrically hold, and then reset again or explode back up. The best athletes have that minimal amortization phase. Right? They're the best athletes. What I mean by those amortizations, what is amortization? Tell them. Bro. Tell them. Amortization is, is, the, is, is, the, the diff, uh, is the in between the stretch, so the lengthening muscle and the shortening of the muscle. That time between, right? We want to minimize that time. The best athletes can minimize that time. All right? That's what we want, right? So um, the landing part is so important. The eccentric strength, I can't express enough. That's why we do heaps of, see, heaps of, heaps of eccentric controlled movements. RDLs, squats, bench presses, pro, uh, rows, you know, overhead press, eccentric loading is so important, very important. But what's the, what's the, what's the only issue with eccentric loading, Alex? Muscle damage, muscle damage soreness, DOMS, late onset muscle soreness. So you've got to be a bit careful. So first of all, i break the skill down. Remember, that adaptation. Neural, muscular, motor learning, skill acquisition. Also, adaptation to task specific. The way you train affects how you adapt. So specificity, as you said. If you want to get better at something, do the skill. So first thing, I'll break the skill down, make sure their jumping's right, make sure they're landing correctly. From there, then I'll look at what, what the most trainable quality that maximizes everything, so your biggest bang for your buck. If they are weak, strength will maximize everything. If they are strong, i.e. two times body weight squat deadlifter, then you probably can work on more uh, KPIs like your power and your elasticity. Power being one jump, maximal jump, elasticity meaning multiple jumps. That's what I look at. And then also, you'd be looking to make sure Posterior chain development is critical when you jump. Jump, sprint, change direction, posterior chain, glutes, hamstrings. Keep the glutes active, keep the glutes strong. I've said to you guys this before. I don't know why, but with my athletes, every time they've maintained strength or gotten stronger, or their connection with their glutes is stronger through bent leg hip extension, straight leg hip extension, good things happen, i.e. injury reduction or rehab. So that's all I know, and the glutes are critical. Without the glutes, we are paralyzed. Thank you very much, Vern Gambetta, on that great quote. That's how I would do it, Alex. Look at all those also mobility as well. Hips and ankle mobility critical. Why? 
triple extension, jumping, hip and ankle mobility critical. If you do not get movement through your ankle or hip, you're gonna compensate up the chain. I'm telling you, every fucking step of the way, you will compensate. Either the knee or the lower back, or even something up, up the chain as well. I'm telling you every time. For reference point to that, boil, boil and cook's joint by joint theory is the best, best thing I've ever read, ever. The body's a series of joints. Every joint needs mobility and stability. Some needs more mobility than stability. Some others need more stability than mobility. Alex. That was good. Gus Leon. I'm curious to ask whether doing cardio work affects gaining strength. Currently in the AFL preseason, lifting and running, when is the best time to do running sessions around my weightlifting sessions to maximize production of strength? Uh, so, open-ended question, that one. Um, so, uh, interference effect, concurrent training. So, where you train... So two, two qualities that really um, uh, don't work together are strength and endurance, right? They don't really work together, really. Power, strength, speed, that neuromuscular really works together, the endurance doesn't. So you always want to do something, always do your strength work before your endurance work, always. Now, the reason for that is you never want to do your endurance, uh, your strength work when you're tired. Why, Alex? Why do you think that is? Fatigue is a very poor environment. Yep. Yep, technique. yep. So, so patterning is a critical thing. Technique and patterning is a critical thing, right? So let's say you're doing endurance work first and you're a bit metabolically tired, a bit neurologically tired. When you go to lift, especially if you're looking to develop power or speed and even strength, which is heavily, um, uh, it's a neurological quality and a muscular quality. Let's say you do do that and you're tired. One, the chance of injury increases. The second thing is you're gonna create what we call suboptimal adaptation. The adaptation that we want from that strength training is not gonna be maximized, really, is it? So that's why I always say strength before conditioning, um, speed before strength, okay? So speed before strength, because you wanna do high velocity before low velocity, high task complexity before low, before low task complexity, okay? Always, all right? So how I look at it would be, you trade, so it'd be something like this, right? Agility, cognitive function before speed, speed before power, power before strength, strength before conditioning. That's exactly how I look at everything in terms of you go from high neurological quality, co cognitive functional, to low neurological function, low cognitive function. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so the metabolic stuff's at the end, the neurological focus at the start. Okay, we wanna be fresh, with it, fresh, fresh to maximize power, speed, strength, endurance, less so at the end. So you always do strength, and that's why um, at college we did, uh, at Maryland, we always did our um, strength before our conditioning. So we do uh, strength before our conditioning and then speed before our power or speed. So we'd have two of our sessions. We'd go uh, strength. So, you, so we'd do our strength work first and we'd do our conditioning. And then, the, then we flip it. Our speed, um, our elasticity jumps work first and then go in the gym and lift second. That's how we do it at Maryland. And I believe in that stuff, doing that stuff first. So um, that's how you'd maximize it. Also, just to let you know, I'd always do the skill before anything else as well. So if, you, if you're looking to do the skill work, and when you do the skill work, what are you going to, depending on what type of um, training session is, what are you going to do, when, especially in a field-based sport like football, what are you going to do? You have to run. So you, you're going to get a bit of conditioning or some sort of load, some sort of conditioning load through your training. But always do your skill work first, then you go on the gym afterwards. Skill's always number one. Very good advice. Jaden Johnson Moody. If someone wants to do more speed, power, focus drills, pre-completing conditioning work, yeah. Would the conditioning work negate any potential speed power gains if this was programmed over a block? Listen, I used to be a big believer when I went through uni, right? So you know when you went, you understand this, Al, because you're sick, nearly going 30 now? Yeah. No, 30. You know when you go to uni, Al, and then you, you think, every, like, everyone puts a perfect case scenario, and then you come out in the real world, and you're like, I call it the 80-20 rule. I've said this before, I think, to the viewers, right? When you go to uni, it's 80% theoretical, 20% practical. You flip it when you come out. 80% practical, 20% theoretical. What's theoretical isn't always practical. What's done in a lab isn't always transferable to the real world, right? So I used to think um, when I used to, um, as a uni, everything was world, perfect case scenario. Now, that's great for the literature, but in the real world where you're dealing with human beings and you're dealing with other stresses, it just doesn't work like that. So um, I used to be a big believer in training qualities independently to maximize the training response. So just train one quality at a time. Now, if you know anything about uh, what we do is nothing's perfect. You might only have them one hour a week. You need to get your most bang for your, tra bang for your training buck. And also you need to train multiple qualities. So doing that, doing your power speed work first, not only is it gonna enhance your conditioning in my opinion, in, especially when you're doing power speed work, because you're gonna, you're gonna ramp up your nervous system, um, I, don't think, I, I don't think it'll affect it in, in the way you think. Um, most people think it's gonna have, oh, you know, if you're doing, if you do, look, as long as you're doing a speed power work first and you're not doing it secondary, 
You always want to do the conditioning work. It's, it's similar to the question I asked just before, so I'm kind of just going over the same topic, but always do the conditioning last of all. If you want to maximize, you know, power speed work will actually ramp up the nervous system. What I mean by that is going to give a potentiation effect when you do any exercise. So no, it's not, in my opinion. Um, and also um, for, for, for time effectiveness, you want, probably want to do something like that, train multiple coils at once. As long as it's in a structured format. Connor Reedy, 28 year old rugby player. I was lifting the biggest numbers I've ever lifted and was feeling great. In late January, I had the flu for about a week, couldn't train at all. Since then in the gym, I've seemed to lost my strength and took 10 steps back. Struggling to lift weight that I was doing in my first and second set. Just baffled to what's happened and pretty damn downhearted. What's your advice? Uh, mate, uh, one, you, listen, that's a warning sign straight away. I reckon you're either overtrained or you're still, your immune system's still depressed, uh, suppressed. Because, mate, if you took a week off training, we know for a fact through literature, you're not gonna lose anything. You shouldn't lose anything. Now, now he's been sick, right? By you not lifting um, those loads that you're used to lifting, that says to me one or two things. One, your immune system's still fucked. It's cooked, you need a rest, brother. The second thing is, um, you haven't taken 10 steps back at all. What you need to do right now is just fully, you need to rest, man. I promise you, if you rested and you took enough fluids, um, vitamins and minerals, I believe that you'd probably get better what you've told me. I'm not a doctor, so my suggestion is probably go to see a doctor, get your bloods taken and get to see what's going on. That's my opinion. I'm sure Alex is nodding because he knows this stuff. I'm a big believer in that. Get your blood, blood work um, taken just to see what you might be. My mother's, um, I'm sure she won't mind me saying this, my mother's uh, uh, low in iron because um, she was feeling a bit lethargic. Mm. And, I, and she went and got her bloods done and um, found out she was low in iron. Most women are. A lot of women are low in iron. So she takes iron tablets and she feels great now. So... Actually, I know she, you know what I know when mother feels great, Alex? When she's giving me shit. That's when I know she feels great. Well, she, Christian! That's my, That's a very good impersonation. Is it? Yeah. Thank you. Christian! <laughs> Christian! Um, yeah, so I'd get your buds done, man. I can't give you more than that. But here's the thing. A really good way to test, and we we'll talked about this in the course in New Zealand, Alex, to test, um, um, uh, readiness before a session, overtraining is a few ways. In my opinion, the best way is listen to your body. How do you feel? And then auto-regulate the session based on how you feel. Now, a lot of people use that and they go lighter or they just do a session that's an easy base session. You can't lie to yourself. If you're feeling good, no reason why you can't ramp it up a little bit. If you're not feeling, if you're not feeling great, maybe do a mobility session, maybe do a recovery session, maybe just do a low intensity aerobic session for re regeneration. Better ways you can quantify it is heart rate. So are using something called heart rate variability, which Alex talked about in New Zealand. You can do um, stuff like, um, uh, what, what else do we talk about? Grip we talk, strength and heart what, rate. Measure it over yeah, yeah, but you have to get a base, grip strength, you gotta um, get a baseline measure. I'll probably measure it over two, I'll measure it over a month, oh, probably a month my suggestion would be, just to get data over a month. You maximally squeeze it, so that's, um, that's a real good indication where, neurologically where you're at. Um, uh, neuromuscular tests, have, um, terms of a, a jump test. So what I do is I would get like the um, smart speed jump mat that we've got and we do jumps. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll get that over a month and then see where their readiness is um, after they've done the SMR mobility activation. So you gotta warm up properly and then you get their maximal height for jumps. And then you might even do a repeat effort jump test. That could be a good indicator of um, a bit of overtraining, a bit of fatigue, see readiness. In my opinion, I'll talk about this at the course, the best way you can know is listen to yourself or know your athlete inside and out in terms of um, look at their body language. What is their body language saying to you? If their body language is saying something like, I talked about this in New Zealand. What a lot of people don't understand is, and this is where the, this is the difference between a really experienced coach and a coach who's just starting off and they're doing their uni three year degree and they think they know everything. And trust me, the reason why I say this is because I used to be like that. Um, that little shit at uni who thought they knew it all and then you came out, you go, I know fuck all. Now you get to my age, you're like, fuck, I know, still know fuck all. Um, but we're all learning off each other, which is fantastic. I just take that view on point on everything. and. For me, it was like, now that I coach full time, and for me, the most important thing when you coach is A, communication, B, relationship building, and get you to know your athlete. So I'll give you an example. The minute you start coaching, which is an art, you start to understand that um, the, the art of coaching is something you can't learn in a textbook. So I'll give you an example. It's like an athlete walks into you. Now you might have an athlete, there's so many stresses. Training is a stress, I understand that, but it's not the only stress. Other stresses include home life, family, work, relationships, study, all, this is all accumulated, right? So let's say your athlete comes in, they've just broken up with their spouse, significant other. 
They've had a family death. As a coach, the human element, you need to say, fuck, this, this athlete is stressed. Maybe instead of doing that max effort session, they, maybe you might send them home. Or if they still want to train, you might do a low intensity, you might do a mobility session, a recovery regeneration session. You might drop the weights and do a speed session. Instead of something that's too taxing, that's going to give them too much focus, it's too much load on the neuromuscular musculoskeletal systems. All right? It's because they're not going to be switched on. This is the art of being a coach. You need to communicate with them. You've got to understand them. Or one day, they might not talk to you. They walk in with their bag. They're slumped over. Their posture's shit. They sit over in the corner. They're upset. So you've got to ask them, how are you feeling today? Get to know them. What, what's going on? You know, what, what's the matter? And they might open up to you. And that's happened to me a million times. I remember Alex, and I'm sure she won't mind me saying this, Amy Melander, um, who's been one of my athletes for two and a half years, played VFL for Climwood. There was a time where, Alex, you can admit um, this. What happened was... Amy comes in, now I know when she's off because I know her so well, this is just me being a coach understanding people. My ability to understand people kind of made me, um, uh, gave me success in this field because I'm just very good at reading people um, re and not reading people in business. I'm horrendous in business, but when it comes to what I do, because I love it, I've just honed my craft. Amy's someone who I understand back to front and she came in real, wasn't talking, wasn't, you know, very, um, very somber mood. And I, I, what did I do, Alex? I looked at her and I said, I, I worked it out in probably about three and a half minutes what was going on. So I said, can we go outside and talk? And Alex, why don't you tell people what you said to me? What I said to you? Yeah, you said, how did you, how did you, how did you know that? Yeah, I was like, what did you look at her to see that? I just look at her body language. Body language is everything. And I'm like, what's going on here? And I knew within three minutes. I said, what did I, I took her away from the gym. And then what happened? She started crying straight away. And I hugged her. And I think, I just want to say, just for the viewers, I think it was really smart what you did. You took her outside of the gym uh, where she had a bit of privacy so she could open up to you. Yeah, yeah. I, I just love that. I bet you, yeah. Well, I have to do that. Sometimes, you know, the human element to this is so misunderstood that you might be the smartest person in the world, like getting HDs and all this shit, but if you can't relate to people, you're fucked. You can't do this job. Even Joe DeFranco talks about it. Joe DeFranco goes, I keep bringing up Joe, but I'm pretty excited to be on the show. But um, Joey, Joe DeFranco goes, um, you know, there might be guys smarter than me, but just his ability to coach, communicate, build relationships with people, and apply his knowledge is, is just second to passion is second to none. And that's what has risen him to be the best in the world and what he does. He's got a world-renowned centre for what he does, and I'm going to go over there to his interview. Still can't believe it. It doesn't hit me yet. It will hit me soon, I guess. It will hit me soon. But that side of me, that side of the coaching side, I've only, you know, the only way you can develop it, Alex, through coaching. Jamie Smith, shout out to Jamie Smith. He talks, he quotes me a lot with this stuff. It's called coaching reps. The only way you can get better at something is by doing it. You need to expose yourself to coaching reps. The more, the better. Get your hands on, get your hands dirty and go do it. Stop, stop, stop saying that you're too good for something. I brought this up last week. Just go do it. That's how you get experience. So I brought Melanda outside. She opened up, cried. I hugged her, loved that girl. I said, hey, hey baby girl, I'm, I'm, I said to her, I'm fucking with you, man. Let's do this. I said to her, I'm with you. And that's another thing about my guys, why they love me and hate me at the same time. You can ask Campbell, he probably hates me now. But I do think, so if I do something to my, my, one of my athletes, I'm doing to get a response out of them. And I, a good response and a bad response sometimes, sometimes you have to do it. But I do it to drag something out of them. I need to make them believe in something to get them to that level. Either it's rehab or injury reduction or performance. That's what I need to do. And sometimes you just, they just need a hug. Sometimes you've got to hug them. And I hugged her and I said, I'm with you. If you, want to, if you want to train, let's train. You want to get coffee, let's get coffee. You want to talk, let's talk. So she, she vented. She vented for 25 minutes, half an hour. We went back inside, had a little bit of a session, half an hour, just a little crab question. Gave her another hug, said, I'm here for you. If you need anything, message me, call me. And I met that because I love her. She's a great woman. Fuck, without her, actually, I wouldn't know my life without her. It was a bit weird without her. She comes in, she's like the furniture here, like fucking Jesse Postons or a, a Campbell Somerville who just sleeps up there next to you, Alex. They're the furniture. That's why I do this stuff. The human element is beautiful. I love doing this. I wouldn't do this any other way. So fantastic. Sometimes you've got to read their body language. If they're a bit down, ask them. How are you okay? How are you feeling? Sometimes I need to vent. Pete, question, answer a big fan of the show, Nick Maines. This guy answers and asks a lot of questions. He's a curious man. I want to be a physique coach, performance coach. My goal is 100 clients a week for online to face to face. What do you have to do to get 100 clients a week and keep them? And also once I hit it, how do I keep building even when I have no time to take on anymore? Do I have to hire people and buy a gym like you? What are your thoughts? First goal. Oh, oh, fuck, man. I don't think you understand how much 100 people a week is. Like, how? I don't think you really understand. Yeah, 100 people a week, and it's that's, just... That's a big six-figure business right there. 
yeah, that's a six figure business, but think of the stress you're gonna go through. I don't think you have a, actually, fuck that. I don't even have a fucking personal life at the moment. I just work. Um, no, I don't have a hundred people. No, I, I, don't I don't, yeah, it's a lot of people, man. I just think that's, you, you just, uh, he's obviously new in this industry, so yeah, 100 people's a lot. So that's the first thing. Second thing. online. Yeah, I think people kind of, people do the online thing, Alex, because A, they, I still don't understand that whole online thing is, is a weird one to me. I did face-to-face first. I only did online because I wanted to evoke more change for more people and I felt like the online market was just dickheads, absolute dickheads and people who just took the advantage of the industry who had no experience, i.e. that fucking Alan Clark fucking loser. Um, yeah, Alan Clark. Yeah, I know a lot about you. Fucking putting that shit up. Fucking. This is actually. You know what? This is. A, this is a fucking. Um, this is a thing. This is. This is my comment to anyone who wants to go online, who wants to lie to people, who wants who have no qualifications but look a certain way, and uh, and they want to sell diet, nutrition, and training plans, cookie cut, all this bullshit. If you want to do that, right? And I'm being fucking serious. This does my fucking editing. If you want to do that, I will fucking call you out, right? because you deserve no fucking respect. You actually deserve my disrespect because there's people out there who put in fucking hard yards, getting degrees in diet, dietetics, fucking exercise science, and you wanna take the piss out of something I fucking love and then go fucking online, say you're an online coach and say you're fucking passionate, that, oh, but I'm passionate, I wanna help people. Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up, you don't wanna help anyone. You wanna help your fucking self. You're a fucking liar, Alan Clark. Fucking all the pieces of shit who want to do that shit. You're a fucking liar. If you really want to help people, you really want to help people, go fucking get educated. Go get a qualification. If that's what you want to do. But don't fucking push this bullshit notion that you're passionate about people. Passionate. If you were passionate, you'd go learn more. That's a fucking lie. And I called you out on that shit and I'll keep doing that crap. Because it's unfair on the industry that I care about and I fucking love. You say you want to help people? Bullshit! You want to help your fucking bank account? I know, I know, because somebody's mother messaged me and I've got an online transcript. If you want me to bring it out, I will bring it out because I know people turn when social media comes. I know, because I met people like that. And what they do is they seek validation from other people. Go on the influencer's page, see the crap people write about them. You don't care about people, you care about yourself. And here's another thing, you fucking sell out. What you people do, you sell out for watches and brands. They use my code for 15% off. And you don't even fucking like the brand. That's a sell out. And I'm looking at you, Commando Steve. Hey, I remember when you sold out. I remember when you sold out and you told people that Apollo Fitness was a gold standard. You're a fucking liar and a fraud, mate. I fucking lie, you you something I love. I fucking love this industry and you lied to these young kids for fucking what? To put money in your back pocket. You're a fucking scumbag, Steve. You're a scumbag. You are. You're a fucking scumbag and you're a liar, mate. You lie to people for what? Enough's enough. And who made me the judge during execution? I did when I decided to change the fucking game. That's now, it. Now, 100 clients a week. What are your thoughts? Oh, fuck it. I don't know. Whatever. I've had enough now. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying though about that? Like, I will call you out. That is not fair. It is not fair on the people who... But, and the thing is, what people say is, oh, you're being, you're being too harsh. You're being this. I don't think I am. No, I'm not at all. Being an authority, and I take that... when pe- and People call me authority. People call me an authority in this industry, right? They look up to me. Yes or no? They do. So I believe I have a right for these people to do what's right and call these frauds out, right? And when I say a fraud, I do not mind. What, what, why, why is an industry, Alex, why, and I keep bringing it up, and I had a fight with a guy last night who came on my page, right? What happens is, people get butt hurt when I say, like, butt hurt when I say shit like, oh, you've, um, you've stayed in your lane, you shouldn't be giving that advice. When the fuck have I ever, ever, I hire, and you know this, I hire people in their right position. You know I'm good at that, right? I've got a physiotherapist to do the diagnosis, early stage treatment. I've got a rehab coach who's in between, Tommy Young. I've got a media guy, you, and a coach with you. I've got, I've just hired a dietitian. Stay in your fucking lane. Why can't we just stay in our lane? Why is it, and of course there's gonna be slight crush, I know that, but why the fuck in this industry, out of all industries, people think just because they train eat, that gives them the right to, or they look good, or they're shredded, and heavens know what they're taking, or their genetics, 
Genix, as you know, plays a big role in everything. Thank you very much, A Wood and G Wood, for giving me my small ankle structures and my small calves, so people give me shit all the time. But why the fuck can't we stay in our fucking lane? Why the fuck is it that we people think because they because they train that gives them the right to be an expert or to give programs away? Or, or give their advice away, or think they're an expert, or because they've got 150,000 followers, they're an expert. Get the fuck out of here. Who the fuck do you think you are? To think you take something that I fucking love, something I've given my heart, blood, sweat, and tears to, to think you're a fucking expert because you've got social media followers. Get the fuck out of here. Get the fuck out of here. Because you get no respect. None. None. And I mean that. Because this is something that fucking fires me up. Because I'm sick of it. And people go, oh, you're a bad per- uh, you ain't just saying, you want to see a bad person, I'll give you a fucking bad person. I'll give you a bad person, because I'm giving you 1% one, 1 of what I can really give you. I made a stand for this industry six years ago, they'll fucking stamp out this bullshit. And you better fucking believe, when I'm all said and done, the legacy is all cemented. My legacy has been cemented, I've changed the fucking game. And not just me, a lot of others, we have got a fucking army. When I started, I felt like I was one man, one man on the moon by myself. Now we have a fucking army. Uh, we are changing the fucking game. And if you think it was bad then, you, people fraud, it's gonna become worse for you. So here's my thing. Be respectful. Don't fucking lie. Don't call yourself a guru at 21. Don't have any qualifications. Be respectful to the people who made it happen, who went out and were passionate enough and loved the game enough to get the right qualifications. And if you wanna learn, fucking fantastic. We're open arms for you. But if you want to lie, and you want to lie to make money off other people, you will get called out. That's all I'm saying. Why do you always do this to me? <laughs> I don't do shit, man. I'm just the messenger. It just annoys me. Do you, want, do you want to talk about the 100 clients? Or you, nah, you're done fuck with that? the 100 clients, man. Fuck, fuck. fuck the 100 clients. Listen, just be passionate. Like, oh, is, it hard, is it too hard to ask? Is it too hard to ask that we all just respect each other? We all stay in each other's lane and we all, and then that douchebag, what was his name? I'll read out his name and give you a phone, you fuckwit. What was his name? Here we go, this idiot who fucking, this dickhead. I'll read out what he wrote. Well, what his name? Fuck him and I have a stash. My old mate, you fucking, Chris Henley, was, had the balls and the audacity to say that, that because I'm saying stay in my lane, because I said that on LinkedIn, he's saying that, oh, you're worried about people going to your lane. What? He, what? I don't, I don't think you understand. I, I promote physiologists. I promote physiotherapists. I promote dietitians. I promote people to all stay in your lane. I stay in my lane. That's what I'm saying. And then he had the goal to say strength conditioning coaches are more um, uh, uh, at a higher level than dietitians to give out nutritional advice. The fuck? Mate, mate, you should never procreate, champ. And I said that. And then he said, I'm a bad person. But, but mate, Mate, use your fucking brains, champ. Never procreate, mate. Please don't. We don't want the world to have another you, please. All right? God for sake. And when I have a son, Christian Jr., he'll tell you the same thing. He'll be sitting right here when he's younger. He'll be listening to me rant. And I probably won't swear because my mother would kill me, but I probably will anyway. Uh, can't wait till the day I have a son. Best, best moment of my life, probably. Second, second to the, I was going to say second to the Joe DeFranco show, but it wouldn't be. <laughs> it'd be guy, it'd go, son, Joe DeFranco show, Woodfords. And then wife might be fourth. <laughs> but anyway, that's what I gotta say. Stay in your lane, have respect for others, and don't lie to people. Why, why, why is it the fitness thing we have to lie? Don't lie. Be, be ethical. Have integrity. Hey, another thing, I'm not perfect. We all know that. I'm not saying I am. But I try, and, I try and have integrity as much as possible. As much as possible. And I think I have the whole six years. Have I, have I, have I been perfect, Alex? No, not at all. Not, no one's perfect. Have I matured a lot? Fuck yeah. 25, bit of a fuck, actually a lot of a fuck with. Made, all, made money, had, all, had a little bit of um, uh, uh, early stage fame from people knowing who you are, let it get to me, got humbled. Now I'm at 32 and I, I know who I am, I know where I'm going, I know my vision, and I'm changing the fucking game. Episode 34 of Ask Woodford. Like always, thank you guys for listening. I couldn't do this out with you. Thank you, I'm Alex Sandals behind the camera. Thanks, Mac Eye and LP support. And thank you guys, I'll see you next week. Episode 35, Ask Woodford. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs>